And now, the next event of uh, today is the Schlachter Lecture. Why did we start, it, start this event series? We would like to do a series of events which uh, year after year focuses on the ideas and the importance of uh, Christian democracy in Europe. Today's event and the lecture of today is entitled uh, Christianity and Public Life Being Christian in Europe right now. And uh, just uh, how uh, nice uh, parallels we can find in life. Genghis Gabor is one of our guests, uh, still listened to uh, our uh, the lecture of uh, the father of our lecturer today. So it seems that there are parallels in life like this. And uh, I would like to uh, kindly ask our lecturer to hold his lecture. But before that, let me say just a couple of thoughts why he was invited to hold this lecture. We think it's uh, important to listen to lectures here in Hungary, which uh, provide an international horizon. And also, these lectures should have a depth to them, because there are lots of public life events where people talk about different topics, and uh, these quite often uh, are only on the level of press articles. But today's lecturer is a truly a deep thinker, not only a lawyer and philosophist, uh, but a committed Christian. Floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor, for your introduction and to the Foundation for inviting me this evening. And as I was listening to the speakers before me and looking at the work that was new to me of um, Sister Schlachta, I was actually thinking, why am I then here as a man tonight standing here to speak to you. So I am starting with uh, some humility in the face of such, great, uh, such a great woman uh, who stands in a long line of great women who have um, shaped Europe in such an important way. And the topic of today, in fact, very much fits to the theme uh, that we heard today with the book presentation and the presentation uh, on the educational project. And the theme that I will speak about, Christianity and public life, what does it mean to be a Christian today in Europe, is a theme that is very close to my heart. It is something that I have thought about a lot for many years, spoken about a lot, written about a lot, and I never fail to find new thoughts, new ideas. And I thought that was good for an evening like this, because as the Barankovic Foundation states as one of its goals, is to find new ways to present Christian democratic thought to the world, and especially to a world that is increasingly post-Christian. But as you will hear from me today, it is vital for the future of our European continent, of our beloved European continent, that we hold on to this Christian democratic tradition, that we strengthen it and that we deepen it. 
Now, during the past weeks, none of you will have failed to notice that the world has been remembering and paying respects to a great stateswoman. You see, today the, the theme is very clearly pointed in that direction. And of course, I'm speaking about Queen Elizabeth II. She was a monarch who had a deep sense of what service to God and to country means. In fact, she's one of the leaders of the free world that I've had most respect for because of the person that she was. And this will be a red line through the thoughts that I would like to share with you. Because this is where it's all about, by being a Christian in society today and being a Christian in politics today. It's not about the votes you have or the programs that you decide or that you introduce. It's about the inner person that you are because from that flows the good that you can do. And what struck me especially in the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II was that moment at Windsor Castle. You saw it at the end in the chapel of Windsor Castle and the moment before Queen Elizabeth, her casket was brought to the side chapel for her to be buried there alongside her husband who died last year. Just before that happened, the three symbols of state that were lying on the coffin were taken off by the Dean of Windsor Chapel and put on the altar. We're speaking here about the scepter, the orb, and the imperial crown. They were taken very reverently from the casket and brought to the altar. Now, the one of those three symbols of state that touched me most and also fascinating to hear the usually um, not so, how can I say, friendly to Christianity BBC commentator explaining the meaning of it, I thought there was a sweet revenge of history there because the BBC commentator was actually commenting on the fact that the orb, so you have the scepter, you have the crown, but the orb was this round object, this sphere with a cross on top of it. That was the orb. And it is given to the monarch at the moment of coronation. So to Queen Elizabeth, 70 years ago, it was given to her at her coronation in her right hand by the Archbishop of Canterbury. And this, the same will happen to King Charles III when his coronation ceremony comes. But what matters here is what the Archbishop of Canterbury says at the moment that he presents the orb in the right hand of the monarch. And again, the BBC correspondent was commenting on this. The literal words are, receive this orb set under the cross and remember that the whole world is subject to the power and empire of Christ our Redeemer. Isn't it beautiful that in our modern times, in our secularizing society, this symbol, this powerful symbol is still present. So it is the symbol of the monarch being given power by God and thus subject to him, subject to God. And so for every Christian in public office, this powerful symbol of the orb points to an eternal truth, not man, but God is the measure of all things. Something that in fact already the pagan Greek philosopher Plato understood so well and wrote in his famous volume, The Laws. 
where he wrote, not man, but a God is the measure of all things. So what does it mean to be a Christian and a politician today, especially in Europe? It means this, to live a life and to act out one's political responsibility in a way that is consistent with Christ being the master of the world and not man. And of course, this is exactly the point where modern man struggles so much. As through breathtaking advances in all areas of human endeavor, he thinks there are no limits and that he can do all, control all, change all, and thus play the master of the world, the master of the universe, leading to devastating consequences and great injustice. And I would like to briefly give you three examples of recent times where we see this distortion happening. And mind you, don't misunderstand me, it is not necessarily bad intentions that we human beings fall in that tendency to want to be masters of the universe. Those three examples, I will very briefly give them to you under a very clear observation that I have. And that observation is that this wanting to play God always leads to overreaction by human beings. And it mostly is to be seen in relation to our dealings with nature, with the realities of nature. And there are three areas where we've seen that in recent time. The first I call COVIDism, the second I call climatism, and the third one I call transgenderism. There are all three areas where we have been harshly confronted with the realities of nature. Where it comes to COVIDism is we've been harshly confronted with the reality of a virus that we didn't know how to deal with. With climatism, we are confronted harshly with a changing climate. And with transgenderism, we are confronted with a new social phenomenon where increasingly young people seem to be uncomfortable with the biological sex with which they were born. Now, instead of us human beings knowing our place and saying, let's try to understand how we've gotten here. Let's try to understand how the process of nature is. Our first reaction as humanity that has made so many advances is immediately to want to fully control nature and to throw everything of our scientific possibilities, the powers that we think to have at that problem before actually reflecting on how did we get here and how can we actually being faithful to what it means to be human, to the nature of the problem, actually immediately fully want to control it and go all the way without limits, without looking at the possible dangers and the uh, second consequences of it in trying to control that problem. I'll just pick out one example of that. The whole debate about the climate change is is a, is a shocking example of how arrogant we human beings are. Because do we really think that we human beings can control the temperature of the earth? That has nothing to say about the fact, the obvious fact that we are destroying our environment as human beings. And that our attitude towards our natural environment is absolutely unacceptable. And that therefore, out of moral reasons, we have to change our behavior. But to go on and claiming as humanity that we are actually capable of controlling the Earth's temperature, 
I find at least lacking the humility that we human beings need in our relationship with nature. Now, before I'm being misunderstood, that doesn't mean that work doesn't need to be done to reduce all the, um, you know, all the bad um, things that we throw into the atmosphere, and that we didn't, don't have to adapt our behavior as human beings. That's not the point here. But the point I'm trying to make here is the way we respond to it. The way we respond to it is that we as human beings say, we can control nature. Whereas if we would have this proper relationship to God being the master of the world, we would understand that a little bit more humility is required and that we cannot control nature. What we can do is work harder not to destroy nature. That we can do, but we cannot control it. So this, uh, just to give you an example uh, of how in our society we have lost this sense today of the proper place of the human being. So how do Christians, and especially those serving in public office, deal with this challenge of an all too human attitude that is ultimately so destructive, especially to the dignity and sovereignty of the human being. And I would like to speak with you here about three characteristics of a Christian leader. And this evening, as we are inspired already in the previous presentations by some great Christians and leaders of the past, I would like to add some to these and to, shore, to share with you three concrete suggestions. I already called them characteristics that might help us to set out our focus and our priorities and to know the proper place, our proper place as human beings in this world that we did not create ourselves. The first one is that the Christian leader in public office needs to be rooted in reality. It's the first one I will discuss. The second one I will discuss is that he or she needs to be ever more educated. And the third one I would like to discuss is that he or she needs to be consistently courageous. Before going into more detail into these three important characteristics, I just want to make sure that we start on the right footing. And for that, I have three thoughts I want to deposit with you. And that is the following. When we speak about politics, either politics is rooted in the well-formed conscience of the individual, the individual person engaged in it, or it is a mere exercise of power and patronage. If politics is not rooted in the individual conscience of the person who is acting, then it becomes a mere exercise in power and patronage. The second introductory thought here is, other than we are often being told, there is no such thing as a neutral worldview, especially not in public office or in education. Therefore, what is required is not value-free leadership, which is something that is often heard, but a leadership that is informed by conscience and lived by virtue. Leadership can only be virtuous or it is not leadership at all. I will come to speak about that. And the third introductory thought is the well-known quote from St. Thomas More, the great statesman of the 16th century in England, what he said about politics and conscience, and it cannot be repeated enough, where he says, when statesmen forsake their own private conscience for the sake of their public duties, they lead their country by a short route to chaos. 
So, having established these preliminary thoughts, I would like to go into more detail into those three characteristics I mentioned to you earlier. Let's start with the need for the Christian in public office being rooted in reality. And here I would like to quote my favorite politician, my favorite Christian politician in modern history in Europe, unfortunately very little known, but nonetheless important, Dag Hammerskjöld. Dag Hammerskjöld was the second Secretary General of the United Nations from 1953 till 1961. Beautiful um, works have been written about him, especially also about his deep religious life. This is what Dag Hammerskjöld says. He says, our work for peace must begin within the private world of each one of us. To build for man a world without fear, we must be without fear. To build a world of justice, we must be just. And how can we fight for liberty if we are not free in our own minds? How can we ask others to sacrifice if we are not ready to do so? He goes on. Some might consider this to be just another expression of noble principles too far from the harsh realities of political life. I disagree, Dag Hammarskjöld concludes. And this is a man who, before being Secretary General of the United Nations, was very involved in Swedish politics. He was a cabinet minister. He had all sorts of senior functions in Swedish government. So not somebody who speaks from a theoretical textbook. So what are these noble principles that may root the Christian and politician in reality when serving in secular European society. The first one that we can distill from this quote from Dag Hammerskjöld is what I would like to call unity of life. The public and the private person are and should be one and the same. I think this is one of the most fundamental misunderstandings that we see happening in politics. If a politician, let's put it a little bit um, dramatic here, if a politician lives a double life and the public finds out, we know what the headlines are. We know what the headlines are. I'm always actually very surprised how upset um, newspapers get when politicians get into private scandals um, because you sometimes think, well, the whole of society is like that. Yes, but the public has high expectations of their leaders and they don't tolerate a double life. So this unity of life is especially important for us Christians especially there. This is also why, I've said that before, why the anger in society because of the church abuse scandals in the past decade was justified. Because as Christians, we live according to a very profound message, a high calling. And if we go around as Christians preaching that and we don't live it and we engage in crimes, then rightly so, people are upset. So this unity of life, and this is the biggest challenge, the unity of life that the public and the private person in politics are one and the same. That's the first element that Dag Hammarskjöld shares with us. The second one is inner freedom free in our own minds, hearts, and souls. He says it so beautifully. 
He says, how can we fight for liberty if we are not free in our own minds? Or in other words, if we let ourselves be guided by whatever, what is politically correct or what others want me to think or what I should be thinking in this world, etc. That is not a free mind. Doug Hammerskirt points that out to us. The Christian politician needs this inner freedom also to be able to make decisions that might not be popular in the mainstream mind. And the third one that one can distill from this quote is knowledge of yourself and your fellow men. We have to know ourselves, we have to know our weaknesses and our strengths and be humble about it. And on the other hand, we have to make this constant effort. In fact, in his little book um, about uh, politics and conscience on, um, the, in the writings of Dag Hammarskjöld, there's a very nice list where Dag Hammarskjöld lists what he thinks should be, so to say, the different, um, uh, the different attitudes a politician should have. And in that, it features very largely this knowledge of your fellow man, wanting to understand your opponent, wanting to understand why your opponent thinks as he or she thinks. What are the reasons? So knowledge of yourself and your fellow man. The person that strives for a unity of life, for inner freedom and knowing oneself and the other is rooted in the reality of what it means to be human. And that is a lifelong process. That is where it's all about. He or she is capable and willing to see and respect the order of creation and our role and proper place in it as humans. That is what I was trying to say with my provoking statements about those three isms at the beginning. Knowing our proper place as humans. This person does not reject God because he or she knows that by seeking to know God, I in fact start to grow in understanding what is human life and how it ought to be lived. Every society that rejects this idea, without exception, as history shows us, falls into dehumanization, barbarism, and self-destruction. And we have seen that in the history of the 20th century. Communism, Nazism, this country has suffered enormously under it. All this means today that the political leader who is a Christian humbly accepts and accordingly acts that not man, but God is the measure of all things. This is a reality that each Christian needs to publicly acknowledge. It doesn't mean that the Christian has to go around saying God, God, God the whole day in politics, but his or her attitude radiates that, accepting that man is not the master of the universe. Without which attitude of life, one can hardly be called a Christian, let alone be an example. The great French industrialist Francois Michelin, whom I had the privilege to know personally, and yes, he was indeed the president of the Michelin conglomerate. We all know it from the Michelin Guide and the Tires. He also was a devout Catholic and a married man and father of six children. And he wrote a little book at the end of his life. It's called, And Why Not? On the Human Person at the Heart of Business. And he speaks about reality here. He says, reality is a harsh, uncompromising teacher because it is always unceremoniously exploding ready-made ideas and prejudices. This is reality. 
And then he goes on later to say, the mystery that exists in every man and every woman should be recognized and acknowledged. And here he comes to a, on a very deep level of what should actually be the role of the state, of the business, or, or the, 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 the organization in which people work. And this also was Francois Michelin's mission in life. He once told me, he said, my, important, my most important mission in life is to make sure that every single worker in my factory, from the one with the simplest menial job to the chief executive officer, that each one of them find their unique vocation through their work. That is what he means to say the mystery that exists in every man and every woman should be recognized and acknowledged. And this also points to this being rooted in reality because that is the role of the state on a very deep level. And of course, this is what Christians in politics should be representing. And so here we come to what is ultimately on its deepest level, what is the responsibility of every actor in public life but especially the Christian, because of what he has received through the gospel. To seek and facilitate that mystery in every person, so well put by Michelin, so that it can be truly human and thus find its place in society where it is called to flourish and bear fruit. It is the core of the message of Christ in the Gospels. Let me move to the second characteristic, ever more educated. All what we have discussed before can only be brought about when Christians are not only well, but very well educated. If we require doctors, lawyers, and accountants to participate in ongoing education programs, why don't we require this for politicians, for people working in government? Even more so, if we Christians claim that we have something unique and important to add to politics, and to politics here in Europe. How can we do so if we are not continuously educating ourselves? How do we think we can ever successfully deal with and counter the many ideologies of moral relativism and wokeism if we only read what the newspapers tell us? Whilst what we need is the enduring wisdom that is to be gained through the study and discussion of the great masters of our civilization. Instead of wasting our time on the latest tweets or Facebook likes, our focus should probably be on delving into the Bible, Aristotle, Cicero, Benedict XVI, or any of the great literary works that the European culture is so full of. All give us answers, concrete answers, to the pressing questions of humanity that Christians in public office have to deal with and how political responsibility should be seen. I'm always struck when with my students I discuss uh, Marcus um, uh, Aurelius Cicero's text on the laws. And it's a very beautiful text because he speaks about the foundations of law and justice. And the text, if you read it, and if you forget for the moment who is the author, you really think that that text was written for today. Because the problems he discusses in that text, the laws that was written so many thousands of years ago, 
are the problems we are dealing with today. And he had answers to these problems then. Another great mind is John Adams, who in the 18th century was the first vice president and later the second president of the United States of America. He was also a man of faith and moral character. And he had a keen understanding of what was the link between education and the leadership of a nation. He established this very clear link between education and the leadership of a nation. He says, the preservation of liberty depends upon the intellectual and moral character of the people. As long as knowledge and virtue are diffused generally among the body of a nation, it is impossible they should be enslaved. Very powerful words. So John Adams, who was one of the founding fathers of the United States and also a co-author of the Declaration of Independence, was convinced that education was essential in the preservation of liberty, of freedom. In this regard, he speaks of the following elements of education that are necessary. He speaks of the need of education in knowledge. And please don't be confused here. He speaks about education in knowledge, not in skills. Skills come later. Knowledge comes first. And the second one is education in virtues. And again, let's not get confused here. Not in desires. Desires are not the first important thing. The virtues, because in fact the virtues teach us how we deal with our desires in a proper way. So, knowledge and virtues. Not doing this, he suggests, will lead to enslavement. First, by our own passions and ignorance, and then by others. Of course, John Adams at that time was dealing with the difficulty of their continuous conflict with Great Britain, from whom they had made themselves independent. But of course, it took many years for Great Britain to accept that. So in turn, this means that education is for the Christian in politics, in modern society, what I would like to call the life-saving sword and shield that enables and ennobles him or her to remain free from enslavement to, for example, enslavement to one's feelings, to the party, to the majority or minority, to the opinions of others, to the Twitter mobs, or the media, or political correctness, etc., etc. We can so easily be enslaved in politics or in general in society to these things. And he warns against that and says that through education we can defend ourselves there and strengthen. And the great um, uh, leadership, secular leadership guru and writer who goes around the world giving speeches to large audiences, his name is Robin Sharma, he even says it. He says, education is the ultimate highway into freedom. And Robin Sharma is an executive coach, so he only uh, advises and works with the top, top CEOs of the world. And this is what he tells them. Education is the ultimate highway into freedom. He tells that to them. So that counts as much for political leaders. Freedom, as the great Saint John Paul II remarked to the youth, is not the ability to do what you want but the possibility to choose to do what is good. Freedom is not the ability to do what you want, 
but the possibility to choose to do what is good. But in order to know what is good, I need to be educated as a leader. My conscience needs to be constantly formed and fed with insight and wisdom, with healthy input. And mind you, that input you hardly find on social media. I'm sorry. And here as Christians, we have so much a bigger responsibility than others because we have been given so much, as the gospel says, to those whom much has been given, much will be asked. And to whom more has been given, even more will be asked. I always shiver when I read that because I always think, my goodness, when I stand before God, I hope I can defend myself. The third characteristic, consistently courageous. The third characteristic of a Christian leader is this calling to be consistently courageous. So not just once in a while courageous, but consistently. And here I would like to begin with returning again to this great modern statesman and Christian whom I quoted before, Dag Hammarskjöld. This is what he says about himself, Dag. He says, from generations of soldiers and government officials on my father's side, I inherited a belief that no life was more satisfactory than one of selfless service to your country or humanity. No life was more satisfactory than one of selfless service to your country or humanity. This service, he goes on to say, requires a sacrifice of all personal interests. But likewise, the courage to stand up unflinchingly for your convictions concerning what was right and good for the community, whatever were the views in fashion. So what does he say here, Dag Hammerskjöld? These are some very important messages that we have to unpack. A man of faith and character who lived and acted through moral clarity consistently and courageously. What are the elements that we can find in this quote? He speaks first about selfless service and giving up your personal interests. This requires sacrifice. Hard words these days to use in public. Then he says, you have to stand up unflinchingly for your convictions. Unflinchingly, once again. This was the Secretary General of the United Nations who said that. A man who was dealing with pretty tough situations. Again, you can only stand up for your convictions unflinchingly if you have been educated, if you know where you stand for. And in relation to this standing up unflinchingly, what is right and good regardless of current opinion or the newest orthodoxy or powerful opponents. And in this book, Dag Hammerskjöld speaks of one of the many examples where he was in reality living this, where he had to deal with the Soviet Union that of course was trying to use him and the United Nations to push through its agenda, like other great powers were doing. And he stood up. It is known, it is recorded um, in the history books that he stood up. Later, he adds the vital importance of being willing to admit that you or those you represent were wrong. I think this is another of these great challenges of politicians today 
but something where I think Christians are specifically called because we are a people of forgiveness is the ability to admit that you have been wrong and also the ability to be able to admit that in public. I could speak hours of examples where in current times that would be a good idea. If we now move back from what a consistently courageous leader is capable of, namely service, conviction, and humility, to taking a closer look at what the virtue of courage itself means and consists of, we learn the following from Alexander Havard in his book, From Temperament to Character, on becoming a virtuous leader. He says that courage has two dimensions. Boldness, you could also call that audacity, and endurance, you can also call that fortitude. Being courageous means to willingly run risks and stay the course. It generates creativity. Now, as a Christian in politics, that is quite a challenge. To willingly take risks, run the risks, and still stay the course. It generates creativity. It also requires a strong will, this courage. It is thus a moral virtue that demands moral clarity. Again, this moral clarity is only possible when we have education. Meaning that your goals are just, respecting basic principles of human nature and the dignity of the human person. Without that, your strong will will lead to injustice. But if your strong will is rooted in a moral virtue that itself is based on moral clarity, then you will be able to pursue goals that are just. Other words that illustrate the meaning of courage are, for example, persistence, faithfulness, being principled, stable souls, practice what you preach. We spoke about that at the beginning. And very importantly, being a lover of truth. And here, there's a, a nice example, or also a, a little bit of a sad example, of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who first started writing negatively about Stalin after Stalin had died, but then started spreading his message against the whole communist system. And of course, then he was exiled. And then he came in Europe, and there he discovered in Western Europe that there were all these, um, all these people that were somehow enamored with what they called socialism with a human face. And, you know, and they, they all, it was all in the saloons of Western Europe. You know, many of them, it was very popular to, to like communism. And what did Solzhenitsyn discover there? That he was as much reviled by many of them there as he was in the Soviet Union. But his courage was that he endured it. He endured it. He stayed the course. In spite of the fact that the part of the world where he fought, he would find understanding and freedom, he actually fought. He actually found much less of it than he had hoped. But he still stayed the course. The consistently courageous Christian in public office has one anchor he never cuts himself off from, a well-formed conscience which is nothing else than the voice of God talking to us, telling us in the deepest realms of our heart what is right and what is wrong. That is what our conscience is about. And like St. Thomas More, who famously said, I am the king's servant, the king's good servant, but God's first, 
he or she is willing ultimately to give up all, even life itself, to avoid doing what is evil or to accommodate it. Any Christian taking its calling in this world seriously has to accept this eventuality or otherwise risk falling prey to losing one's soul. And recently at a meeting I attended uh, of Catholic legislators, we heard a testimony of a member of parliament from an Asian country who had and who has a very powerful position in his party, but who refused to give in to his party wanting to redefine the definition of marriage. And he said, he stood before us, and he said, I am willing to give up all the political capital that I've built up, my position and everything that I have done in politics, because I'm not willing to sell my soul on this fundamental principle for me. So it is not just theory, it is something real. That is what I call real courage. And it is our single greatest challenge in life as Christians in modern society to hold the line on that courage. But don't be concerned. This was the single biggest challenge during all generations. St. Thomas More, 500 years ago, was in exactly the same position as then Lord Chancellor or Prime Minister of the British realm. I come to my conclusion. In his deeply insightful book, Live Not By Lies, Rod Dreher quotes a Russian pastor, Sipko, who explains what secularization has done to contemporary Christians. Sipko says, Christianity has become a secondary foundation in people's lives, not the main foundation. Sipko, seeing this points to how many Christians in that country and in the rest of Europe, I would say, are going back to the attitude their forefathers had to take under communism. They have a very clear understanding that their faith in Christ means they are going to have to reject this secular world. Now, I realize this is a strong statement, maybe even unacceptable for you, but it should upset you. It should upset you because it points to a truth most Christians still refuse to acknowledge that increasingly it becomes clear what is meant by Jesus' words calling to us to be a sign of contradiction. I want to close, however, on a note of hope and great prospects. In the words of this great American president, John Adams, to his grandson, Francis, or Charles Francis, he wrote in one of his many letters to this young man, arouse your courage, be determined to be something to the world. You are responsible to God and man for a fine genius, a talent which is not to be buried in the earth. If we Christians, and especially those in public life here in Europe, heed this call, our future will be bright, and what is good and just in the eyes of God will prevail. For that to happen, we need, as again Robin Sharma says, heroes and saints, the mighty mission they constructed their lives around was to exist for a cause that was larger than themselves. 
That mighty mission begins with being rooted in reality, ever more educated and consistently courageous. That is what it means to be a Christian and a politician today. You can try to fit in or you can change the world. You don't get to do both. It is your choice. Thank you very much. The, our lecturer made possible to ask questions. So now it is uh, possible to, to ask questions from our lecturer. Uh, interested in whether anyone has any questions? To be honest, I did not want to ask any questions, but uh, I'm sure that we have to initiate this process. And if you know me, you know that I uh, like to uh, provocate others. And I'm happy to know the lecturer and uh, a different version of this lecture I already listened to in 2020 in the midst of the pandemic. And uh, then it was uh, possible to ask him in similar topics from all over the world, over the internet. Everyone was joining in from their home, from their garden, uh, from the loft and so on. And uh, uh, meanwhile, this logic, this very clear logic is really captivating for me. And I would like to personally thank him uh, for coming here and uh, sharing this uh, in a different uh, circle. Uh, as a practicing uh, politician, you kept talking about uh, um, um, reality itself. And also we have to talk about the principle of, of democracy, the democracy of majority. And if uh, you have to be uh, voted for, elected, then, then uh, uh, as a practicing uh, politician, uh, of course, we uh, receive a lot of encouragement. But this logic that we have heard about now is uh, not a majority opinion in Europe. And of course, I have a sort of an answer, but uh, I would like to hear your opinion as as a politician living in a, a democracy, democracy of majority, uh, what should a Christian politician do in this setting? Thank you, Gyagi. Um This is a, a question we could probably spend the whole <laughs> a whole other uh, seminar about, but let me let me answer your question in in the way of a, maybe I can say it in that way of a dream I have had for many years and which is also what motivates me to do the work that I'm doing with politicians, and that is that we we know through history that in 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 important parts of history, there is always a tipping point, a tipping point. That is that something happens that finally turns the tables in the right direction. And it is my dreams, my dream is, and you know, uh, let's see if it's a realistic dream, but my dream is that there will come a point that we have so many authentically Christian politicians that are willing to work 
on the basis of this logic that I have represented, that this will lead to a tipping point that it does become a majority. What I'm trying to say with that is the following. What, what I'm sure you, you know all too well, you know it from the European Parliament and all your political work, um, if you are a minority, um, it is very difficult to um, go against the tide and to represent principles. And uh, the, the most difficult consideration a politician has is, okay, if I do this or do not do this, I might not get reelected. I might lose my seat. Now, not all politicians have that in the same way, but this is an important consideration that a politician has. And so very often, without realizing, the elected politician is almost only focusing on, okay, how do I get reelected? How do I make sure to get reelected? And in that process, very often, they then start selling their principles and selling their souls. And I think we as Christians have the unique calling and opportunity to do that differently. And I believe, and I've seen it happening already in, in, in some countries, I believe that if enough people are willing to say, no, I am willing to lose my seat because I am not willing to sell my soul. Like this, this example I just, just gave you. Uh, in fact, that story is a continuing story. You know who I mean. I can't reveal the name of this person. But um, this person actually has been in touch with me and has said, Christian, you cannot imagine how my stance has completely changed the discussions in the government because they were never expecting me and some others to actually resist this. So I believe that if more Christians have the courage to stand up and to say no and to indeed risk all as, as, as this logic indeed includes, there will come tipping points. And it might take in one country five years, 10 years, 20 years, but at the end of the day, and here I'm speaking purely from a religious perspective, for the individual Christian in politics, what does it all matter whether that tipping point does or does not come? At the moment, you stand in judgment before God and you have to you know, you know, give account of your life and of whether or not you remain faithful to your conscience. Because at the end of the day, when I die, I am only responsible for my life, not for, for the lives of others or what this elected politician would possibly have done after me if I would have lost my seat and another much worse one would come. This is another thing that we often hear. And understandably, I'm not judging anybody. It's all <laughs> totally understandable. Huh? But I'm not responsible for the other person. I'm responsible for my role and my actions. So uh, I hope this answers your question a little bit. Sokan vagyunk itt, akik nem vagyunk politikusok. Many of us here are not politicians. What could we do? How could we help uh, support politicians to become like this, a person like this? Uh, whether we find some of them and create a community for them where they can strengthen each other, what do you think? How can we support uh, this process, uh, this tipping point to come? Sister, that is a beautiful question, which immediately reminds me of my mother. <laughs> because my mother is uh, a, a woman of such great wisdom. 
And one of the things that my mother always did when we were children, and which she told us to continue doing, is she said, always invite the parish priest to your house as a family. Because the parish priest needs that support from a family, needs that support in his pastoral ministry. And so I think, as you already suggested, we need to do the same with our uh, Christian brothers and sisters who are in politics. And in fact, this is part of the work that, that I am doing, but it needs to, to happen not only on an institutional level, but it needs to happen much more on a personal level. Unfortunately, um, politicians are so often reviled in our society, but instead of continuously criticizing our politicians, we should do in, indeed that. You know, If we know politicians in our family, in our friends, if we know they're Christians and we know their strugglings, bring them into our houses, invite them to dinner, support them, carry them, uh, help them through. That would, that would, you know, do enormous good. So absolutely, yes. Inkább kérés, mint kérdés. Lehet, More like a request. Is it possible to make this lecture downloadable uh, from the website of the organizers? Already done. It's going to be available. I would like to move further on uh, about the topic that uh, George talked about. There, there, is, there are these tipping points. You know that uh, Mr. Professor is a historian as well, a philosopher as well. I would like to hear a couple of these tipping points, examples of these tipping points, under which circumstances uh, do these uh, tipping points come about? Well, the first tipping point is Hungary. <laughs> uh, because in Hungary, of course, in, in this regard, of course, we see that with the Hungarian fam family policies, uh, is, is a good example of, of where we have seen such a tipping point. But I would also like to, uh, like to point to two other tipping points. It has, obviously, in the European and Western media only been uh, reported on in a very negative way, but the fact that the United States Supreme Court overturned the Roe versus Wade judgment from 1973 in which abortion was made a federal um, fundamental right and actually returned that to the individual states. That has been a major tipping point as a result of people consistently speaking up. Um, of course, this, this was a court that did that, but there were a lot of politicians in the United States Congress, uh, in fact, in both parties, who for years and years have spoken up uh, on this uh, and have helped for this tipping point uh, to come about. Uh, because um, once again, uh, unfortunately, the, the media coverage has been very one-sided about it. But, uh, but uh, it was a legal anomaly that, uh, that this uh, Supreme Court uh, ruling in 1973 was passed and had such a massive negative impact on the United States. And once again, it was brought back to the individual state. It was brought back to the democratic process uh, where it belonged. So that's another tipping point, a very clear tipping point, I would say. And another tipping point uh, that, uh, that we also see, um, it's, it's the very special friendship and relationship 
that existed between three people that were decisive next uh, that were decisive in the fall of the iron curtain uh, in europe and those were john paul ii ronald reagan and margaret thatcher this is something we often forget and now because recently gorbachev died everybody was immediately saying he was the one responsible uh, for the fall of communism. I don't think I have to tell Hungarians that that was not necessarily entirely the case. Um, but it's true that Gorbachev obviously uh, did not intervene uh, in the way his predecessors have, have, uh, have done. But my point is not that. My point is that three people who all had strong convictions and were willing to stand for those convictions, something that very many people forget, I still remember it, that maybe a month before the fall of the Berlin Wall, French President Mitterrand still said that it was unimaginable for Germany to be reunified, that it was unimaginable for communism to fall. Huh? Um, he was still saying that, and he was not the only one. Yet there were three politicians who had very strong convictions about that, and who started working together. And that did lead to a tipping point. Of course, the, the most important tipping point where it started, of course, is the visit of John Paul II to Poland in 1979. Uh, um, uh, but that's where the process of various tipping points started. But it was because there were three people who had strong convictions, who were willing to be ridiculed for those convictions. Uh, Reagan was ridiculed I remember that very clearly in school, how Reagan was ridiculed for him speaking about the axis of evil, you know, where he, uh, where he spoke about the evil, uh, the evil of the Soviet regime. He was ridiculed in the schools, but no, he stood very firmly. Now, I happen to know that one of the people who influenced him most in this policy, and who was actually the one who established diplomatic relations between, um, between the Holy See and the United States was President Reagan's national security advisor, and before that chief of staff, a devout Catholic by the name of Judge Bill Clark, Judge William Clark, uh, another man of conviction who also had to endure a lot of ridicule in the cabinet even, of Reagan on this stance, but he had this important influence. So I think that's another example of a tipping point. Well then, um, I would like to thank our lecturer for this uh, thought-provoking lecture. I would like to thank you for joining our event. And uh, please uh, note in your calendar that uh, next week, uh, same, we are going to meet uh, for the second lecture, same place next year. Thank you very much.